Physicians for Wine and Health is a real deal. Uh, the, it sounds a little bit, uh, Joe Campbell, Fred Benoit, and uh, John Bauer are physicians that uh, started it and it came into being in 1995. And, we meet a couple of times a year, we have lectures, and we've uh, dug out specialists in different fields. Uh, it's just an interesting, plus fine wines and a great meal, and then once a year we do a wine tour uh, to some um, place that's noted for wines. Uh, let me try this here. History of wine. Started in Georgia, Georgia, Europe. They found a uh, some residual something in the bottom of some kind of container 13,000 years ago. It may have been beer. Uh, the, big, the first one that really uh, had a wine uh, variety or cultivated really was in Persia, and it was Shiraz, Shiraz or Shiraz, Shiraz as they say in Australia. The, uh, it's ironic that that's the one that got started in the middle of Iran now. I mean, that's kind of a... I thought it was an irony anyway. Uh, the Romans picked up the grapes and spread it throughout the air, their, um, spread it throughout the, uh, their empire. It's uh, part of the, there's a discussion about them being able to conquer North Africa because they carried wine with them. And as the locals retreated, they dumped a dead sheep or something down the well and when they mixed the water with the wine, it allowed them to drink it without getting sick. And so the Romans were able to take over North Africa, conquer North Africa, thanks to wine. <laughs> History of wine in Italy. Wine was uh, preferred over beer. Only, the only way we really know that is because there are still caches of hundreds of thousands of amphora, the wine container, that were found in Spain, that are being found in Spain and southern France. History. Uh, OK, one more. There's wine is being made in every state of the United States. Uh, Hawaii makes wine. Alaska, they ship the grapes in. Uh, it's, I have had several times in Lincoln, Nebraska, where Nebraska makes wine. And it's a lot different than we drink out here in Oregon. <laughs> it's pretty, uh, everybody just, there's a real love for your own product, I guess. <laughs> Made in every state. Burgundy versus Pinot Noir. They're the same thing. Burgundy is a region that grows Pinot Noir grapes. This line, this red line, is the line that's the 45th parallel, and that's what comes through here. So they have an equal sun, winter uh, exposure to what we have here. And the, uh, they've looked around in Oregon and found similar earth and, and uh, terroir is what they call it, the environment. What about champagne, prosecco, cava, and, cava and sparkling wine? Champagne, like Burgundy, is the name of a region. And they make champagne out of coincidence, Pinot Noir, Chardonnay and uh, Pinot Meunier, Petit, Petit Meunier. Uh, the, uh, it's a combination of grapes that makes it. This, this is Chardonnay. This is Prosecco land. It's a sparkling wine, white wine, but made out of a different grape. Italy has cava. I mean, uh, Spain has cava. They make it out of their local grapes. They can't call it Chardonnay because it's not from Chardonnay. But, and in fact, in France, there are lots of areas that make uh, sparkling wine, and they call it Cremant. C-R-A-M-A something, N-T, M-O-N-T, something like that. Bordeaux versus Cabernet. Cabernet is a grape variety. It's a single grape. Bordeaux is a blend, and it's, um, there are two issues in Bordeaux, in, uh, in Bordeaux, left bank and right bank. And the right bank is a blend of red wines, predominantly Merlot. The left bank 
is a variety of red wines, predominantly Cabernet. So Petit, uh, the, the big chateaus have kind of specialized. And so when you drink Bordeaux, you're really drinking a There's that 45th parallel. Let me catch up myself. We have a thing in uh, Napa. Napa is a pretty amazing place. The um, total, uh, they make uh, about $50 billion, $50 billion uh, revenue that are spin off of that great thing down there, which is larger than the entire gross national product of Croatia. Just a little. <laughs> uh, here we have, uh, but it's a Bordeaux meritage is what it, they call it there. They can't call it Bordeaux because it's not from Bordeaux. But they call it a table wine or they call it meritage rhymes with heritage. Uh, Walla Walla, Walla Walla, the AVA or the area where this, the grapes are, happen, overlap Oregon and Washington. So you can have some Walla Walla wine that came from Oregon. But if you haven't been to Walla Walla, it's amazing. It has certainly changed in the last uh, 10, 20 years. I've been there 20 years or five years. We were just there a couple of months back, and it is wine. It's wine shop, wine shop, tasting room, wine shop, tasting room, uh, toy shop for grandparents to buy, grandparents, <laughs> lawyer, realtor, wine shop, wine shop, wine shop, bookstore. It's, it's amazing. It's really, it's really a fun place. Um, Canada has a red wine program as well. Uh, the Okanagan Valley is uh, number, Ontario, the state of Ontario is the number one produ producer, but the Okanagan Valley is, uh, uh, has 14 hours of sunlight, and so they're able to grow things a lot better than we can here. Let's see what we got here. There's Okanagan Valley, great Pinot Noir. Grapes, Pinot Noir. Oregon, when you call it an Oregon Pinot Noir, a wine Pinot, it has 90% of Pinot Noir grape in it. Um, that's a state law that kind of, the largest winery in Oregon is King Estate, four and a half, 440,000 cases recently. The thing about Pinot Noir is clones. There are, it's easy to think of apples, and there are Gravenstein, and there are Granny Smith, and they're red delicious, and they all taste a little different, but they're all still called apples. Well, Pinot Noir has different clones that have Pomard, Vadensville, 777, the different clones, and they all taste a little different. And so when you have, when it's, the bottle says Pinot Noir, unless you get really into it, you really don't know what you're getting until you get kind of deeper in the program. Um, what do we got? Local laws dictate the uh, percent of you know, the named grapes. In the southern Rhone area, let's see if I've got that. Uh, they have up to thir around Avignon, they have up to 14 varieties in their red wines and their white wines. The, uh, uh, each Winery has a little special blend. It kind of depends on what's in the, what was good that year, how it was harvested, and so they make it. They, everyone's different. Every year is different. That's the thing. Okay, red versus white wine. Alcohol is uh, red is for hunters, white is for fishermen. That's kind of what the, the alcohol uh, in wine is about. Generally speaking, 12 to 15 percent. In Oregon, it was the original grapes grown here were more than 12 and a half to 13 percent. And as the uh, industry has matured and kind of tried to cater to people, they want something. The community wants something warmer and rounder, and the alcohol has crept up, and so now it's they're warm and round and big at. 14% or 14.5%, that's pretty common. The climate's changing and it's having a dramatic effect on here in Oregon. In fact, the, uh, the warmer the climate, Napa Valley, um, the higher the alcohol. 
So it's up to 15% that, and maybe higher in some Zinfandels and, uh, but it depends on the yeast, how much yeast, how the yeast can live in the alcohol before it kills itself off. The yeast is a waste product, has a waste product, alcohol, and then it, it, die, it kills itself off, it stops. And how are we gonna manage this climate change here in Oregon, and how do they do it in, everywhere? Um, things like uh, canopy man management, managing the number of leaves per plant, uh, is it sh keep them shaded or unshaded or whatever the thing is. Harvest time, harvest earlier to keep the uh, percent, the lower percent. In fact, there's a, one of our physicians for wine and health crew, Dr. Jones, has owns Abacella, and he's raised, he came on in, uh, around Roseburg and raises Tempranillo, a Spanish wine, one that he's done very well with. His son is uh, one of two wine climatologists in the world, uh, Greg Jones, Dr. Greg Jones, and recently Linfield College hired him to be the head of their wine program. So it's, uh, Oregon is preparing for this climate change. Uh, blind tasting, world production. Uh, there's some updates since this. Let's see if I get one. Let's see. Um, number one is Italy. Number two is China. China? Number three is France. Four is Spain. There are more square miles of vineyards in Spain than any other country. What else? Australia is seventh. Now it's eighth. Uh, the Chinese wine program has just come on in the last decade, and uh, they have enough there to enough of a population to keep it consumed. But it's going to be available someday. The, um, Another comment about Australia. I spent a year there in 1968 and 69 and became aware of wine at that time. It's always approachable and it's always inexpensive. So if you, if you get in a jam, pick an Australian wine. Everybody, they love them all. Yellowtail, 12 bucks a bottle. Uh, it's, life is good in Australia and uh, they've enjoyed growing the wines over the years and taking a, a, a place in the world stage as far as wine goes. Uh, wine and food, or for it should be food and wine. I've always wondered about the, uh, these guys that bring a bottle of wine to, to a restaurant because how do they know what they're gonna eat? You know, to put the things together. The red, uh, let's see, what do we got here? What to drink with what? White with white and red with red is a very simple idea and it works almost all the time. It's not a problem. In fact, uh, several of the wineries here in Oregon make a white Pinot Noir. You just take the skins off early and it's white. And if you want to, we had some uh, this the other night. What have we got? Wine and food, Cabernet, okay. When I was in Las Vegas, um, the sommelier, my family, for political reasons, don't eat beef. Uh, since my daughter went through Mrs. B Mrs. Ball's third grade class, as far as uh, being environmentally aware, the, uh, at McKinley, the, uh, so I asked the sommelier at the Picasso restaurant, one of the premier restaurants in Las Vegas, what, what can I eat with uh, Cabernet? And he, his, his answer was, if you don't eat beef, eat beef. Well, if you don't eat beef, then you eat duck or macaroni and cheese. Those work well too. <laughs> Pin, uh, Pinot Noir, Pinot Noir goes with everything. Pinot Noir is food friendly and that's why it's so popular. Uh, it's getting to be the higher percentage alcohol and make it more the center of the meal rather than part of the meal. But uh, it just goes with uh, meat, it goes with fish, it goes with uh, just lots of stuff and it also goes with chocolate. So. Champagne, sparkling wine, uh, uh, oysters. Um, it's got a little acid, so you can do it with some fat stuff, you know, like cheeses, and uh, uh, it mixes well with uh, conviviality. Southern Rhones, 
Southern Rhone is a heavier, warmer wines and wine, and they it goes with everything because it's got such a blend. It's, it hasn't it hasn't got one thing. It's got it's basically um, just a warm, round, red, approachable, approachable wine. It doesn't have to be aged. It's it's uh, they work with, and Sauvignon Blanc. Sauvignon Blanc is a white wine in France. It's from Saint Cyr, which is the area, but it's uh, also from Australia, and they've got some. I mean, from uh, New Zealand, and they've got some in California. Each one is incredibly different. We drink my my wife and I drink a lot of New Zealand wine, uh, Chardonnay, uh, uh, Sauvignon Blanc, and it's the thing that to think about there is the area Marlboro, like the man, Marlboro man. Any of the wines that come from that area are all, it's not like McDonald's, they're all the same, but they're pretty darn close and they're all delightful. Crisp, clear foie gras. What do you eat with foie gras? Um, port, something sweet, something, and it uh, works well, or a sauterne, those are sweet French wines. Those work well. Um, Regional wines. It's interesting how to wine and food, what to eat with what. Uh, a trick that has generation, distillation of generations of observations or something. Um, if you're in Burgundy, drink Burgundy. It's anything with the, if it didn't sell, it's been there for hundreds of years. If that didn't sell, the winemakers wouldn't make it and they want to make something that goes with the food. Um, reds with Italian tomato sauce. That sounds, and same thing with tomatoes. Pinot Noir, uh, Dijon is in uh, Burgundy. Mustard, Pinot Noir and mustard. Hey, good combination. Wine and health. Oh, coincidence? The, uh, Wine and health. In fact, we've met uh, twice. I've met uh, Dr. Kurt Curtis Ellison. He was the guy that visited with Morley Safer about the French paradox, and that's been sort of poo-pooed. But there's something about it that's um, why aren't these French guys dying like flies? Because they all they eat is foie gras and wine and you know fat and well they exercise and they do different things. There's a guy. Um, Dr. Klatsky, he's the, I don't know what is it, epidemiologist or something from Kaiser Permanente. He has, they have 60 years of lifestyle studies. And uh, it shows that moderate drinkers are healthier longer. Now what is that? You know, that's just, uh, it doesn't have anything to do with, uh, the Scandinavians drink as much as the Italians, but the Scandinavians drink it all on Friday and Saturday night. <laughs> and the Italians and the French drink it throughout the day. So, yeah. We've got a, uh, f uh, this resveratrol, that's passe now. It's, you, you know, science is improving. We're learning things all the time. And uh, resveratrol, you have to have a bucket of it to have any kind of effect. Uh, the big things now are flavonoids and antioxidants. Um, alcohol use disorder. Uh, so I just we just had a lecture two weeks ago about this. The head of the Oregon Primate Center is a doctor who's uh, doing a lot of research on um, things, lifestyles, age, and stuff like that. And it, she has incorporated this wine thing into it, alcohol into it. And so she made a little presentation uh, to our group. It increases, it, they don't call it uh, alcoholism anymore, they call it alcohol use disorder. And um, it increases in like 18 to 25, 22 is when it really hits big. People are binging. After 25, you've got Mortgage payments, family obligations, and things like that, that seem to kick in. And the graph is huge at the beginning, and then it just tapers off to, uh, you know, this risk of transition from social to habitual drinking tapers off, you know, after 25, dramatically. 
How big is a glass of wine? That's always, so just doing a little math, even old math, 750 milliliters and uh, five ounce glasses, you get about five uh, glasses of wine in a bottle. At our home, we drink a bottle a day. And if I'm quick enough, I get the three, and Kathy gets the two. <laughs> but uh, it's, uh, I, it's, so to do a little more math, if 120 calories per glass or something like that, all of a sudden, you're up to a whole bottle of wine is uh, 625 calories, or plus or minus, depending on things. That's the same as a Big Mac. And so you get a whole bottle of wine for a Big Mac. So why do all the diet uh, programs say, cut out the alcohol? Well, it, part of it is, uh, it cuts down on, uh, I'll get to this in a bit. It, part of it is it gets, your, you're a little disinhibited from eating more seconds or dessert or all these things. So it's, uh, I think that's, it's a true thing and I've done it myself. Uh, not drunk wine for a, uh, a month, and uh, I lost eight pounds. Were they really worth it? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> hangovers. The big thing about hangovers is hydration. Uh, there are lots of things. Um, just stay hydrated and uh, while you're drinking. Only if you drink during a meal, but if you're drinking, hydration is the, the side effects of dehydration are it. You get some inflammatory things that can be helped with non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, ibuprofen, Advil. Stay away from Tylenol. Tylenol affects your liver and so does the alcohol, so you're kind of doubling your, your issue with the uh, um, alcohol and uh, hangovers and Tylenol. So avoid the Tylenol. Headaches. People get headaches from a lot of different things. One of the common one is this um, Sulfur. People have problems with sulfur, and there are wineries around that use to sulfur. They have sulfur-free. There are no sulfur in their vineyard or in their winemaking process. The um, the reason they use sulfur, though, is to prevent. Um, it's kind of a preservative, and it also helps control mildew in the vineyard. Having uh, moldy wine grapes just it doesn't work. Wine politics. Now this is a tragedy. Uh, well, I don't know tragic. You can do whatever you want. But um, Senator Strom Thurmond was uh, a senator for over 50 years, and uh, at the end of um, 48, he served 48 years. His sister died of alcoholism when he was young, and he made a vow that he would do everything in his power to control alcohol, and he was coming out of this prohibition era too. And so he uh, was in charge of the state, the Senate Interstate Commerce Committee. So it wasn't until his death that all of a sudden you could send a bottle of wine to somebody in a different state. Or you could, the, wine, the, vineyard, the wineries could send uh, wine to different states. The, these are the ones that the white, the light ones are the ones that have been, uh, that you can tr uh, ship to. Now this is being updated all the time, but one of my friends was, uh, there are places in Texas that you can't ship to. <laughs> what? Trying to ship to uh, Washington DC. The bottle has to go through Maryland. Oops, not gonna happen. Just, wh not wacky, but that's just the way it is. One of the things that we have in, in wine, in wine versus politics, or cigarettes versus marijuana, the government has traditionally, and it may be Strom Thurmond's legacy or something, not spent money researching these, um, what's in them. It turns out that chromatography shows there are 17 different constituents in wine. And uh, an acquaintance of, of, of mine, uh, um, Neil Shea uh, is a professor at Oregon State, and he also owns uh, Bluebird Hill Winery. He was trying to do some research on wine and health, and uh, the tannin 
the, the oak thing that you get from the barrel, the taste that taste is kind of tannin. Well, you can do that. You don't have to do. You don't have to buy the expensive barrels. You can do it with wood chips, or you can do it with resin, or you can do it with powder. He raised uh, a serious amount of money and bought 50 lab rats or 100 lab rats or whatever the so lab rats. Now these lab rats have to be perfect, you know, identical, all these things. And he put them on the same diet, same uh, athletic activities, everything was the same, except one of the guy, one of the teams got a little extra tannin powder in their meal. Totally the same. Uh, those guys lost 10% of body weight. So wine as a, 13%, I'm sorry, 13% of weight reduction. Wine as a dietary, maybe. Weight, wine for weight loss, that was that story. Okay, now let's see, what have we got next here? Wine for gun disease. There's a guy in Arizona who, uh, I saw a presentation at the World uh, Wine and Cardiac uh, Conference that his implication was that it increases capillary permeability so that the stuff can get through capillaries and uh, who knows, I don't know. I tried to invite him up to our meeting and pay his way and, and we haven't got any response. So I don't know if that's still a real legitimate thing or not, but I saw a, a something going through a, cap through a cell, so it's out there. A trick that uh, Buy on bread, sell on cheese. There's that grease and acid again. You know, the cheese is the greasy kind of thing, and the but on bread you get a clean taste of what you're. If it's a acidic or tannic, or it's something, it's just an easier. It's a way to kind of cleanly make a decision about whether you do it, way you do it or not. Uh, what have we got here next? Taste and the story. Part of the. The taste is part of it. The story is part of wine, too. Sharing it with friends. There's always a story about the bottle. Even if it's, I got it down at uh, Costco or something and it was on sale. That's the story. But it, it's, uh, in Oregon, we've had an interesting opportunity. There's a guy by the name of, I don't know if his picture's going to come, Robert Parker. Robert Parker is from New Jersey, and he has a terrific taste, memory, something or other. And he has a newsletter. And he's the guy that gave the 100 point wine score to wine. He tests all these wines and he gives them a rating and he's got a scorecard. It's a real deal. And there have been other people who've tried to do it and um, not as successful as he is. But interesting, uh, he standardized the wine throughout the world. And now this 100 point is leading us all into a warm, round wine that's higher in alcohol. That's the Parker effect, they call it. The, um, in Oregon, I was going to say, we have a, a neat opportunity here. There's a small winery called Beau Frères. Beau Frères is up by Gaston, and it is French for brothers-in-law. And who are the brothers-in-law? Robert Parker is one of the brothers-in-law, and Mike Etzel is the other one. Uh, so he's... I don't know if he reviews his own wines, but uh, the Wine Spectator magazine certainly does, and uh, they do it so, you know, sort of blindly. And uh, uh, Beaufrères has got is one of our outstanding wines in Oregon. If you get a chance to have some Beaufrères sometime, brothers-in-law, uh, share it with friends. There you go, powerful. <laughs> Wine pricing. Uh, the number of wine, wine price, you see what this does here. Wine value, costs. The thing about the wine deal is the cost of the land, the cost of production, the cost of the actual water that's in it doesn't, isn't that, and some, some places have taxes on them too. So, but you get a place like Napa, the price per acre, even in Oregon. My brother is a divorce attorney, and if they used to be, if the property was a view property, it went for a little more than on the flat. Well, now if it's view property, we also call it potential wine <laughs> vineyard. So that's even more. So uh, it's the price is kind of a deal. The number one uh, 
wine um, maker, big big shot, is Ernest Gallo. Gallo, number two constellation brand, uh, brands. They're a conglomerate that owns Mondavi and Kim Crawford, Marlboro, the man. And uh, number three is the wine group. Number four, uh, Two Buck Chuck. What is that? Who, what is that thing, anyway? Two Buck Chuck, his name is Franzio, Franzia. He's not, he's the uncle or the brother, I don't know. Some, he's related to Franzia Wines, but he's not Franzia. And uh, they struggle with this, you know, black sheep relative. His deal is uh, he's the nephew of Ernest Gallo. That's the story. And he wants to uh, cause, he thinks that the price of wine should be the same as water. But now water is getting kind of expensive. <laughs> these, these uh, you know, glacier, thousand-year-old bottles of, of water that uh, um, his comment, he, to quote him, I don't make wine to put in a closet. We make wine to, to drink. Two buck chuck, there we go, all right. You say you're a wine snob? What's your favorite, two buck chuck? There you go. The largest wine banker, the largest wine uh, outlet in America is Costco. Costco has a great, they even have Kirkland wines are great wines. I've, Visited the winery down in Napa, been seen the vineyard. I haven't been in the winery, but uh, Costco has got great prices, and they jury the wine before it comes in. So if it's in Costco, I don't work for Costco, but it's it's a great place to buy wine. Their wines are always top notch. Screw top cork, plastic reconstituted cork, glass. Cork is that annoying thing between you and your wine. That's. Uh, <laughs> what it says down below there. It's, uh, they all work. Uh, cork is sustainable. That was a reluctance to, to use it. Now they've got it so that you can, uh, traditionally, the cork had a little bit of breathing, a little tiny bit of breathing. And the, the plastic and the glass don't, um, the screw top, there's some problems with the little liner that holds it, but it all works. If you're gonna buy a wine to hold for a while, it's, um, the trick is lay it down so the cork stays wet and keep it, keeps it swollen. Let's see what we got here. When in doubt, ask the wine person. I, it's uh, in a restaurant. And what do you prefer in wine, single or double figures? <laughs> I think that when you go to a wine or to a, a restaurant and you don't have a vision of what you would like to do, ask the wine server, the sommelier, or the, the waiter. And you, the, the, the best thing is to tell them what you're going to eat and then give them a price point, a, a something that they can work within. And there's a variety. There are great inexpensive wines, and there are great really expensive wines. So. Uh, Give the waiter a little bit of a chance to figure out what's going on. Corkage, room, board, books, and tuition. I draw the line at corkage fees. Big, <laughs> yeah. Corkage fee, that's an odd, you know, it's 20 bucks or something. It's, and it's just to provide the glasses and um, I don't know. I've always struggled with bringing, as I said earlier, I've always struggled with bringing wine to a to restaurant. but. If you've got a special wine or something, then uh, it, that's okay. I, I, I can't one side or the other or the deal. Wine terms, reserve, that which goes out the window after too much wine. That's that uh, dietary thing. Yeah. Oaky, the taste attributed to wine by people who have never tasted oak. <laughs> wine storage, it's alive. It's got, it changes. Um, 55 degrees is what, it's sort of underground, these underground caves were all, and that's traditionally where it was stored, and uh, so that's where it's evolved, that people drank it. Uh, bringing it up to room temperature is fine too, it's not, uh, in fact, I was, uh, uh, well, Chardonnay at room temperature is totally different than Chardonnay chilled, but it's, it's a, still a great wine. The um, Ch 
leftover wine, gosh, it's, I think that what happens is that oxygen gets in there and it changes. And it is a change for, it's just different. Sometimes it gets tainted. If there's any taint in it, that all of a sudden brings up the taint. And so uh, using it for cooking, using it for whatever, it's, uh, this shows an item, you know, making ice cubes of wine. I just put the cork back into it and serve it the next day. I don't, I don't go too into it. Wine storage. If you have one bottle of wine a week and you want to hold it for 10 years, that's 520 bottles. If you have two bottles of wine a week and you want to hold it for 10 years, all of a sudden you're getting into more than just a closet. So um, 10 years is kind of a fancy current um, idea about, oh, this is 10 years old, this is wonderful. And it, it's different than it was originally. 95% of the wine drunk is within a week or two of purchase. Memories. I've got four cases of corks <laughs> that, I, that I just bring these memories up and you remember the, the meal with friends and stuff like that. Memories are part of the, are part of the wine deal. Outstanding vintages. The some years are um, the weather is just right, the location is just right, everything is just, and those are different than other years. You have, the, I think that it's. Uh, I had a deal one time when I was drinking um, a Chardonnay that was just so wonderful, and and so we bought a case, and then we bought another case, and then we bought another case, and we went back and. Uh, it's gone, it's over. That season, that, uh, you know, that harvest is over. And so we did the, you know, 96 that year instead. It wasn't the same, but, you know, keep an open mind. But things change and it's, uh, okay, what's glass to use? Um, the deal about um, Pinot Noir is in this red wine glass, is that it brings the, it has a big surface area allowing for a lot of volatile beautiful smells or something, and uh, it brings it together so you can drink it. In fact, the Oregon Pinot has a constricted a glass, has a constricted top to focus the, the bouquet even more. Uh, champagne has evolved from a coupe or a goblet kind of thing to a, this vertical uh, deal. It holds the sparkling in longer. I never really had that much problem with the old one, but <laughs> this doesn't spill. This doesn't spill as uh, as easily. The white wines. The trick about wines. Let's see if I. What have I got here? I'm going to go back one notch. The trick about, especially about um, white wines or chilled wines, is holding it by the stem. Because it, you you hold it the the uh, bowl in your hand, it warms the wine, and that changes. So postponing the warming it if, is a, is a thought. Drinking wine, how much is a full glass? Uh, Riedel is one company that makes wines and they're, they've done a lot of research and about what kind of wine, what kind of, they have a different wine for this and that, and Nebbiolo and all these different grapes. You serve it to the bulge in the glass, that's kind of where it is. This, that's kind of the glass is, however the glass is uh, shaped, that's kind of how to, how to hold the glass. Okay, we got to that. Thumb and forefinger. That's just to keep it cold if you cook. Cooking with wine, spiced wine's great. Uh, my brother uh, is a, the baker at the Benson Hotel, and he says, use the cheapest stuff you got if you're going to add spice, because it's not going to be. <laughs> just keep uh, champagne cocktails. Use the cheapest stuff you can get for champagne cocktails. You put sugar in it, you put some bitters in it, and uh, regional cuisine. Matching the food with the wine, I mean, with the region, and the wine is tainted wine, tastes and smells like barnyard. It's, and when you get something that you don't, you think, ah, oh, have the server or the sommelier check it out. It's quite, uh, we did it to, at a, one time at a restaurant. I think it's tainted, took it back, brought the next bottle out. It was also sort of tainted. Let's try something else, go a different direction. So anyway, smells like wet cardboard. These are uh, 
I don't know. Traveling to wine country, drink local, drink Oregon wine. Going to Italy, the four Bs. Um, oh, I was gave it. Barolo, Brunello, uh, Barbera, and uh, uh, the other Nebula. Uh, Barbaresco. Barbaresco. But what about Chianti? <coughs> That's Brunello. And 1D, Dolcetto. It's, those are all food-friendly wines, and they're just wonderful to go. Wine wisdom necessarily doesn't mean better. Is expensive wine worth it? Eh, I don't know. Expensive wine and old doesn't necessarily mean better. Taste is personal. Any wine you like is good. And I get on kicks. We get on kicks and drink Chardonnays all summer or, or uh, Sauvignon Blancs all summer. Wine wisdom. The answer may not lie at the bottom of the bottle, but one should at least check. <laughs> Thank you. I would have... This, this year it was my office's 34th annual office wine tour. And I tell you, we've never had a problem finding new wineries to go to. There are over 700 uh, vineyards in Oregon now, and it's growing all the time. Uh, if you do wine tours, um, we did themes. We do themes. Wineries with great views, wineries with uh, great uh, gift shops, wineries east of I-5. There are all kinds of reasons to go on wine tours. Uh, I want to especially thank Gwinnell, Dr. Gwinnell and Anderson for helping, helping me put this uh, PowerPoint together. Uh, it's more effective with, all, with you know, the big picture rather than me just rambling. I have time for questions. Any questions? Question in the back. Yep. I see somebody had a microphone. Yeah, this is Dave. Um, first of all, what's leftover wine? <laughs> Second of all, um, the last time I paid a corkage fee, it was 12 bucks, and you got to figure that the restaurants double their prices, so if you got a $25, $30 bottle of wine, you're paying 50 60 for it, you're ahead taking your own wine, you know you got something you like. And you mentioned sulfur uh, in the wine, um, sulfites, I mean. Uh, what about uh, histamines? Have you heard of histamines? Uh, alcohol and especially red wines have histamines and they can cause headaches. Yeah. So I started taking uh, a natural antihistamine like nettles or butterbur and it's remarkable. Oh good. I, I, I tell some people just take some ibuprofen beforehand. The, uh, this, uh, it's, this is old news but the London Grill, my brother worked there, works there and uh, it's no longer there but they tripled their wine price so if you could when you said doubled, I thought, well, some of them double, but some of them triple. Yes. Hi. Um, you, you started off talking about something called AVA, and I've noticed that on wine labels, and I have no idea what that means. What AV is it? Thanks, Gush. Uh, AVAs are um, sort of our answer to Champagne and Burgundy and things. They're areas that are geographically similar because of the earth, the type of earth. Is it sediment? that's been uplifted, or is it volcanic? I mean, I can get really into this whole different things, but those AVAs are all similar. And uh, when uh, Ken Wright, one year we went to Ken Wright's place, and he, he's a great wine, one of the Oregon big winemakers, um, successful winemakers. And we had, he's got all seven AVAs now. He didn't have uh, Pine Ridge, or uh, Ribbon Ridge, which is up near Gaston. But my staff, we tried six of the AVAs, and which one did you like best? And we have all kinds of wine levels of appreciation in, within the staff. People liked Eola Hills, right here down the road. That's the AVA that, out of a barrel, these group, this mixed group of wine drinkers uh, appreciated, they liked it the best. That sort of answer your question? There's sort of, you know, there's a climate to and north side of the, south side. Earth, it's basically earth and climate. The, um, 
and the effect of the wind coming from the beach. Uh, the Van Duzer wine has got that winery, that area has this evening cool breeze that really allows the grapes to become more complex and don't have to you know, cook all night long. Yes. Hi, my name is Franca. Um, so I had the pleasure uh, last year of going to the Republic of Georgia and did a little tour which included wine and I, I guess that was the first time I discovered that their wine was 7,000 years old. Or maybe 13 or something. Or, yeah, so I was, <laughs> well, I mean, I was impressed and the wine was, uh, was delicious. I, I did have a glass. Um, and the other thing, you talked about wine. I buy all my wine at grocery outlet and I only drink Italian wine and, and if I can't find that I'll drink, you know, maybe French or German, but, um, but I've got my wine there at really competitive prices and they're all good. I mean, I, I did one or two that were bad, but I did mostly and good like, wine. This tainted wine thing is a, is a troublesome thing and they kind of get, used to be part of the cork world, corked world, and it's, uh, they're kind of dealing with that. I buy, Sandy, I use Sandy Am wine just up the street here in Roth's Vista Market, the uh, convenience and the wine people, as I said, every year there's a new, it's the same label, but there's a new product. And if the wine buyer or the person, the salesperson, gets to Tammy, knows what I like, or some, you know, she said, hey, try this, think about this. And she kind of knows my price point. And so uh, developing a relationship with the, your local wine seller is, I think, worthwhile. Um, hi, Dan, and this has really been great. Um, I was wondering, do you think, what's your opinion about the forest fires and how if the smoke hangs over um, the grapes, do you think it makes a difference? It, it does. It's, it's got a residual, it's a film on the grape, and how do you get rid of the film on the grape, and it's going to be incorporated into the, and we're getting, the first, in 74, I went to my, uh, with my uncle, it was a, uh, worked for Tektronix, and, and we're, and four or five guys from Tektronix, Dick, Erath used to work at Tektronix. So these groupies went up with Dick and Tom bought this 10 acres on Dundee Hills. And we did, uh, <laughs> we picked a versimeter uh, that day and took the toad up to Dick and uh, he was the only guy there and he, he had this little turner over and took the to toad into the stummer and it was, uh, you know, sticks and stones and slow moving mammals. It all went in and uh, <laughs> So we've come a long ways from that. In fact, uh, I've seen uh, at Domaine Serene, uh, Evenstead, uh, Grace and Ken Evenstead, on the inspection belt, uh, picking out uh, bad cl clusters or deformed grapes or thing. There's a place in Walla Walla, we're just there, and they've got a machine that it, it picks the color, with this, the, so they're off the stem, you can pick the color. If the color isn't quite right, or there's some flaw in that thing, there's a little sh jet of air that shoves it up and go puts it into the sort out machine thing. It's getting very sophisticated. This is Ken. <clears throat> I'm worried about Oregon Pinot Noirs with climate change. Yeah. Uh, well, we've got the, the guy, at, uh, Greg Jones, Dr. Jones at, uh, at uh, Linfield is here working on our own soil, and uh, he's a world wine climate guy. Canopy management, you know, they're gonna try to, and harvest earlier. One other thing I didn't mention that I would, this uh, Pinot and Chardonnay, uh, those are what go into champagne, or sparkling wine, I should say. And we've, we're developed, we've got some really nice sparkling wines here, if you get a chance to try Oregon sparkling wines. Argyle was from the classic soda, uh, different things, but they're delightful. I don't want to, I'm on, I'm supposed to stay on task here, so on the time, so somebody tell me when I'm time's up. Okay. <laughs> yes. Not quite. Um, another p uh, good place to acquire wine around here is uh, Trader Joe's. Yeah, they have a lot uh, of imported but not, wines. But I, but I do have a question for you. Um, I think one of the um, um, underrated, if, if not appreciated, wines in Oregon is the Pinot Gris on the white side. Uh, and I wonder how you feel about it. That's the major product from the largest winery in Oregon, uh, King Estate. Their Pinot Gris is what's sold all over the place. Yeah, Pinot Gris is, is growing. 
It's working better than the Chardonnay did. There's some tricks to the uh, uh, grape game. When the first pioneers in Oregon uh, grape guys came up, they brought the, they went to school at uh, Stockton or Davis, and uh, they brought their vit, their varieties up here, and they didn't work because it's not the same temperature and and uh, season as it is in California. They were always sour, and it was just ah. And then they snuck some in, some guys snuck some in from Burgundy, what a wacky thought, used the same, and all of a sudden, we've got all kinds of wonderful wines here that get ripe during the season, that they're supposed to get ripe, and it's, uh, it just takes, a while, takes us a while to learn. But I, I, the Trader Joe's has a lot of imported wines, which is fun. I have a question about German wine. You didn't mention any of that white wine. I, I spent 18 months in the army in Germany, and the one with the little black cat, that's really popular, <laughs> that has, has a little black cat on it. Uh, they're white, and the Rieslings are, I don't drink them. I'm not against them. I just, they're just not in my, the wines I drink are Pinot Noir, I drink Sauvignon Blanc, I, dr I drink Nebbiolo, that's that B one. Uh, and we drink uh, some Chardonnays. We used to drink a lot of Chardonnays, but uh, now I, I got one more little. So we were down in at in Ashland, no, in Ashland, in Eugene at Xenon, and they had wine by the glass, and it was lunchtime. And so I, it was one for three dollars and one for ten dollars. And Kathy says, "You can't have that ten dollar one." You have to have the three dollar one. <laughs> I said, "Well, I'll have the ten dollar one, and you have the three dollar one, and we'll do a taste test." And I tell you, I was blown away about the ten dollar one. I still know that I still remember it. Woodward Canyon, Walla Walla, uh, wonderful round. It was I just discovered oaky buttery I mean, that day, and it was you know twenty five years ago, whenever it was. Uh, there's a difference in wine, and uh, it's not always price, but sometimes. In that case, price made me a little more open-minded about the price. Yeah. I guess this, I, uh, we are at one minute, so I think we want to thank you very much, but next time bring samples, please. <laughs>